Hello there, I'm Jimmy Vegas and welcome to the seventh video in the beginner's guide to Unity 6. This time we'll be covering C Sharp programming. Remember to subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with every tutorial I upload. Feel free to leave a comment and drop a like. I also have a Patreon page where you can help be a part of this channel. And you'll also find all the scripts and the assets to this series there too, along with plenty of other things. You can also now join as a free member. Now, on with the tutorial. So, programming is something a lot of people always find to be the most daunting part of game development, but it's not as scary as you would think. What we'll do this time is we will create a script, we'll explore the script and we'll get the script to do something in our game. Firstly, let's create a folder specifically for scripts. So let's go to our assets down here, right click, create, folder, we'll call it scripts. And in this folder, let's then right click, create a new script. Let's call this starter script. And then let's open that up. It will open more than likely in Microsoft Visual Studio. And when it does, you'll notice some default lines of code are already in place. Let's go through these lines of code to understand what this script is basically doing at this point and what we're going to do to it to make it do what we want it to do. Firstly, at the very top, we have something that says using Unity Engine. Now, you have to remember that the c -sharp language that we're programming in here is not specific to Unity. This up here is known as a namespace. And you can think of a namespace as an area of the code that can be used as like a library. So there are lines of code within this script that you'll need to know where to go to. So it refers to the namespace so it knows that, ah, that line means this, simply because we've stated it in the namespace. So if you were to use something perhaps like a scene manager, you would need to just to declare it inside the namespace. Like I said, it's like a library. Next, we have the class. Now the class name needs to be the exact same as the script name. So if we were to change the script name at any point to say, start a script for, we would also need to change the class name. Most coding that you do will be inside the class. And that's dictated here by this open curly bracket. And you'll see it goes all the way down to this close curly bracket. Whenever you code something like this, they should always be contained inside curly brackets. This way the script knows that that's this section, that's that section. Just like we have here with void start. This is known as a method. And a method inside a script is a section of code that can be run at different intervals, whether it is when the script starts, whether it is a constant, whether it's when it's called, via another script or when we do something in the game, perhaps press a button and it runs a different method. These green lines here are known as annotations. They are not lines of code, they are just notes that can mean different things. For example, like it says here, start is called once before the first execution of update after the mono behavior is created. What this means is that void start will run as soon as the game starts and it will only run once. Update is called once per frame. That means that the update method will be run constantly. So this script will be constantly monitoring what is going on. So this script, what we're going to do is we're going to add in a couple of variables and we're going to set those variables and we're going to make those variables do something. So what is a variable? It is anything in the script that can be referred to something else. For example, a number is a variable. A piece of text is a variable. A game object is a variable, an audio source is a variable. And that's how the script knows that what you want to do is relative to those variables. So let's start by declaring a variable. Let's declare a whole number. So after your open curly bracket at the top, hit return. And let's type in square brackets, serialize field. Now, what this means is that we want whatever we are declaring here to appear inside our inspector panel. The reason we want it to appear there is we want to visibly see that what we're doing means something, that something is actually happening. You could have this as public, however, that may use more resources than you would want it to in the larger scheme of things. So for now, to get it to display in our inspector panel, which you will see 
fairly soon, we serialize the field. After you've done that, we now need to declare the type of variable. And as I said, it's going to be a whole number. And another word for whole number is integer. And we can shorten that to just int, I-N-T, which is how we declare a whole number. So I-N-T. It will turn blue. And the next thing is something you would name it. So let's call it my number. And the way you declare a variable, there's no set actual way of doing it, but the most common way is known as camel casing, where the first letter of the first word of a variable is always lowercase, and every subsequent letter is uppercase. So for example, my number. Then you would use a semicolon to close the line off. Most of the time, whenever you finish the line, it will end with a semicolon. There are other cases, for example here in the start method, where you don't need a semicolon. However, these are where it does differ a little bit. Whenever we're declaring a standard line of code like this here, it does need a semicolon. If you hit return, you'll notice this gray underneath is starting to predict what it thinks is the next thing to do. And it is indeed true. So what we can do is we can press tab and it will automatically fill that in because we want the string, which is a text, to be our next variable. Our third variable is not going to be string, my description. We're actually going to create a bool. A bool can be true or false. It can only be one of those two. So once again, let's type in square brackets, serialize field, and then we'll type bool, B-O-O-L, and we'll put um, my choice with a semicolon. And you can see that all three of these, the type is all highlighted in a nice blue color. That kind of gives you an indication of the ordering of how all this comes together. So you serialize your field, you have your type, and then you have your name in the white. But that's not strictly true all the time. For example, you could still declare a variable without serialize field or public. You could simply put int my other number, semicolon, and you'll see this being relative a little later on uh, in the video. So let's also have a game object as a variable. So we could actually refer to an object in our game to do something. So let's serialize field in square brackets and let's type game object. And you'll notice this is a little different. This is highlighted a different blue color. Don't let it throw you too much. Don't worry. It's still going to be declared as a variable. However, what I do want to point out here is capitalization is important. You'll notice that I do have a capital G and a capital O. However, a lowercase g and a capital O means something different. So although they both say game object, referring to a game object with a lowercase g is different than an uppercase g. Either way, we now have the type as game object, so let's call it what we want. Let's have this called as my gate, semicolon. And obviously that's going to refer to the gate that we had previous. Now, what we'll do is let's delete the green lines here because they're the annotations and we don't really need these annotations now, so they can be deleted. And what we want to do is I want to actually save this script now. You'll notice these green lines down the side. That means that everything is saved just fine. That's what's changed since the last save. That's fine. If we head back into Unity now and add an empty game object, and let's call this um, script holder. And now let's take this script and let's place it on the script holder and you'll notice over on the right we have some values set. Now we have four variables right here however we wrote five variables didn't we? Do you remember what I said about this one here? Well this variable exists in the script but we can't physically see it in the inspector panel because it's not serialized and it's not public but that's fine it's just kind of illustrate that that's how you can still declare a variable. So back in Unity, you'll see that my number is zero, my name is nothing, my choice isn't ticked, and my gate has no game object attached to it. Well, if we press play, 
everything should still function as normal. Nothing will change within our script. So how do we make this now so as something will happen? Let's make this script do something, okay? Let's head back to um, the script itself. And let's start by saying, let's put my number as four. So what we can do in void start, because we want this to happen as soon as the game starts, we'll say my number equals four. Nice and simple. Let's make my name equals something. So we can say my name equals, and in quotes, you'll know you've done that right when they turn kind of a red color. And I'll just put Jimmy. And then we'll say my choice equals true, which will mean that that box is being ticked. And you'll notice I've, after every single one of these lines, I'm putting that semicolon again. And finally, what we'll say is my gate, we're going to make it visible. So the idea of what we'll do is before we actually play the game next time, we'll turn off our gate and then we'll make the script turn it back on. So we can say my gate dot set active and in brackets, true, with a semicolon. Now let's save that script. So all we've done at this point is say, okay, yep, yeah, we set our number to four. My name is Jimmy, choice is true, and we'll turn the gate on. So that means if we head back into Unity, and you may get this down here. So my name is signed but never used, that's fine. A yellow warning inside console is never massively important. It's not game breaking. Uh, but what we will do is we need to attach our gate over here to this variable. So you can drag and drop gate onto this section right here. And what we've done there is we've now made this script realize that whenever we refer to my gate, it actually means this object right here. So if we take our game object called the gate and turn it off up here, make it disappear, the script will then be responsible for turning it back on whenever we press play. So if we go to game view, we can see it's not there. However, let's press play and we should see this gate appear and then open. Perfect, and that's all done via the script. So if we go to script holder now, we can see that those variables we set are there. We, it's been set to four, my name is now Jimmy and the choice is true. And you can take that even further depending on what you need to do. So. Let's say, for example, we want to say, if my number is four, then my name is Jimmy. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, Fred. So we can do that in void start. We need to say if, and then open brackets, and we can say my number double equals four, and then close bracket and open curly bracket and hit return. So. Why have we used double equals there? Well, when it comes to coding like this, equals and double equals means two different things. So here we're stating that it should be equal to four. Here we're asking, is it equal to four? So that's how we can say that, is it equal to four? Is it equal to or less than four? Is it not equal to four? That kind of thing. So we can say, if it's equal to four, then I'm gonna take this line of code I'm gonna cut it out of there, just my name, Jimmy, and place it in here. After that, we can say else, and then open curly bracket, and we'll say my name equals Fred, with a semicolon. And naturally, let's get rid of this blank line of code. Let's save our script there. So what we've done here is, whenever we start, it's going to be four. So Obviously, let's start this uh, script now, and it will say Jimmy as my name, and it does. However, if we were to start this script with the number as three, save it back into Unity, let it compile just for a moment. When we start the game now, the name will come up Fred, like so, simply because we have put a statement in here to say if something is something, then do this. Otherwise, which is this section here, you should do this. Now the great thing about what we've done here is that this can be used in a live situation, which is where a void update comes in. If we were to take these lines of code here, so from if 
all the way down to this closed curly bracket and cut that out of there and place it inside update, save, head back into Unity, give it a moment just to compile. And if we press play now, the name will pop up with Fred. However, if we change this value here in the inspector panel to four, the name changes to Jimmy. If we change it to five, it goes back to Fred. Zero, Fred. If we change it to four, it changes to Jimmy. So you can see just how live this will be. And you can then increase whatever these if statements do. For example, if we only want the gate to appear when my name is Jimmy, we can take that line of code and place it in here. But we can then do the inverse of that and say, if my name is uh, equal to Fred, then my gate that's set active is false and that will turn it off. So let's save that script now and quickly recap what's happening here. The script will start, game will start. We set our number to three and my choice to true. It means that constantly monitoring in the update method, if it's four, then we make it say Jimmy and we put the gate on. If it says anything else, it turns the gate off and says Fred. So let's go back into Unity. Let's press play and the gate will not appear. Cool. Let's change this to two. It still doesn't appear. Let's change it to four. The gate appears and changes to Jimmy. But let's change this to five. The gate disappears and the name is now Fred. Change it back to four. The gate reappears. So in terms of coding, this is a very, very simplistic view of coding. And there is more things that you can do. Like you can nest code together and you can add things to it. So for example, if my number is equal to four and, and we'll use a double ampersand, my choice equals true and then save. And what this means now is that the number has to be four and the choice has to be true. So the number can be four, but the choice could be false and the gate still wouldn't appear. So let's try that out now. But this is a great way for me to say that whenever you code something like this, always save it, always go into Unity and check out things little by little to make sure the code works as intended. So here, like I said, so if we change this to four, the gate appears and it changes to Jimmy because my choice is set to true. However, we can untick my choice now and it disappears. And you can keep doing that on, off, on, off. Nice and easy. Perfect. And there are different ways that you can approach this as well. As I said, this is a very simplistic script and um, there will be more coding later on. Um, it's just what you basically do with this kind of thing. You can create a small script and build up from there. That's always the best way to do it. Don't try going in full on script, full on trying to get it done perfectly. Build it up from the start and you can work with it. Uh, I will put this script in the pinned comment, uh, a link in there for you to download. It's in the description as well. If you want to download it, put it in your game, trial it out, test it. Uh, and next time what we're going to do is we're going to add a player into our game and we'll explore the asset store and talk about how useful that is to you as a beginner to Unity 6. Remember to subscribe, click the notification bell, stay up to date with every tutorial and I will see you next time.